And yet all the wealth of Lydia, a region of central Anatolia, sandwiched in between the Greek city-states of the Ionian coast and the mighty Persian Empire to the east, was not enough for Croesus. A haunting greed caused him to want more. Always, always more. And so he journeyed across the Aegean Sea, traversed the Boeotian Vale, and eventually made his way up Mount Parnassus to sacred Delphi. And there he met with the Pythia, the foremost priestess of Apollo, the one who peered into the future and prophesied things yet to pass. And Croesus, in his never-ending pursuit of wealth and glory, asked her, What will happen if I lead my armies out to attack Cyrus the Great and the Persian Empire? Will it bring glory, or will it bring doom? And through the mist the Pythia responded, After crossing the Halys, Croesus will destroy a great empire. And so Croesus headed home confident in his plan to attack, assured that success was on his doorstep. After gathering his army, Croesus went against the Persian armies of Cyrus. The battle was fierce, and as the Pythia predicted, it was one-sided. As the dust settled, the Lydian armies of Croesus lay dead and wounded on the battlefield, shattered like his dreams for wealth and glory. Croesus assuredly cursed the Pythia for lying, but lie she did not. All she declared was that Croesus would destroy a great empire. Little did he know that empire was going to be his own. So goes one of the most famous prophecies of the Oracle of Delphi, a famous misinterpretation that led to the downfall of the once prosperous Lydian Empire. And while the downfall of Croesus leads to good storytelling, it also raises a series of questions. Who was this woman who held sway over emperors? How did Delphi become the center of such religious and by proxy political power? And for our purposes, how did the Oracle herself proclaim such prophecies? How did it actually occur? Was it with a clear mind and conscious, or was her mind altered by bribes or coercion, or perhaps even mind-altering substances? In this episode, we'll dive into those questions and many more as we explore the mysteries surrounding the Oracle of Delphi. Before we get to the Oracle itself, let's get situated in time and space. The site of Delphi is located on the slopes of Mount Parnassus in the region of Phokis in central Greece. Habitation at the site goes all the way back to the Mycenaean Bronze Age, but it was only in the 8th century BC that Delphi became famous throughout Greece for the prophetic powers of the Pythia, the priestess who foretold the future to some of the most powerful men in Greece. The site itself is famous for more than just the oracle. In classical times, it was considered to be the very center of the world. Zeus, it was said, sought to find the center of Gaia, Mother Earth and to do so he sent two eagles soaring around the world in opposite directions. Eventually the eagles crossed over the location of Delphi, and that place became known as the Omphalos in Greek, the belly button of Gaia. To mark the spot, Greek sculptors created a stone, also known as the Omphalos, to pinpoint the location of the center of the world. Amazingly, we have archaeological remains of that stone, or at least one version of it, still preserved today. Scholars believe that in antiquity, the Omphalos Stone of Delphi was located in the very center of the Temple of Apollo. This area of the temple, known as the Aditon, was where the Pythia, the priestess, sat on a bronze tripod delivering her prophecies. But wait a second here. Where did this whole Temple of Apollo come from? Weren't we just talking about Zeus, like his eagles, just a minute ago? No, that's a, that's a great question there. Let's talk about Many versions of the birth of Apollo exist, but one of the most popular is told by Hyginus, a Greek living during the early Roman Empire. In his version, Zeus got the hots for the goddess Leto, and after hooking up with her, she became pregnant with twins, Apollo and Artemis. As usual, Zeus's wife Hera was not so happy about this, so she sent an enormous, venomous, deadly dragon-like snake called the Python to chase Leto around so she couldn't give birth. Leto ran around and around and around and around looking for a nice, comfortable, quiet place to pop out some babies, and eventually Zeus gave her a helping hand, the least he could do probably, and raised an island out of the sea. And it was there in front of all the gods except for Hera, she was still pretty pissed off, that Leto gave birth to Artemis and Apollo. As Apollo grew up, his god skills became pretty impressive. He controlled the sun, music, and wisdom, and healing. 
a rather pretty awesome grab bag of impressive skills. Not only impressive, but also things that humanity loves. Sun, music, wisdom? Sign me up for that. Sounds pretty good. Anyway, Apollo didn't just stop there. He also wanted to set up a place where regular people could come and ask questions of the gods. And after zillowing all the possible locations, Apollo settled on the dramatic mountainside site of Delphi. The only problem here is that Delphi is now guarded by a monstrous snake, that same old python that was chasing around his mother Leto earlier. Now he's back to cause more problems for Apollo. But being all grown up now, Apollo was now a stone cold boss and calmly took his bow, strung an arrow, and killed the hideous python. And after that, adding insult to injury, he changed the name of that site from Pytho, named after the python, to Delphi, forever sacred to the god Apollo. At its center sat the famous Temple of Apollo, and with its aditone, or Holy of Holies, sat the Pythia, or High Priestess, sitting atop a bronze tripod and delivering prophecies to some of the most famous leaders in all of Greece. We'll come back to that priestess and figure out whether she was huffing fumes in just a second. I promise we'll get to that. But first, let's take a look at the not-so-mythical founding of the city of Delphi. As we talked about earlier, the earliest inhabitation of the site goes all the way back to the Mycenaean Bronze Age, the middle of the second millennium BC. It's really not until after the Greek Dark Ages, starting around the 8th century BC, that things really start picking up in terms of material culture at the site of Delphi. We start to get a steadily increasing presence of pottery, and the first evidence for votive dedications, remember those are gifts given to the gods, namely bronze tripods like you see here, which are essentially giant bronze cauldrons that stand on three bronze legs, somewhat like a big bowl on top of like a camera tripod. It's these types of unique dedications that suggest to archaeologists that Delphi was an important religious site from a very early period. Today, numerous temple ruins dot the mountain slopes of Mount Parnassus, once belonging to ancient Delphi. What we are seeing, however, is simply the latest in a chain of religious architecture. The extant remains of the Temple of Apollo only date to the 4th century BC, the 300s. We have written records, however, that suggest a much earlier history, noting that the current temple was built on the site of a 6th century temple, which in turn was built on top of a 7th century temple, suggesting that the substantial Apollo-centered worship goes all the way back to the 600s BC. So you might be wondering, like, what's up with that? Were they just crappy architects? Could they not build things that lasted? And the short answer here is that natural disasters in the Greek world often leveled some of their mightiest structures. And it was a fire in the 6th century which destroyed the earliest temple, and then it was an earthquake in the 4th century which leveled the 6th century temple, causing the need for the, the new one, the one you're looking at here, to finally be built. The Temple of Apollo itself was a peripteral Doric temple. And just in case you don't know exactly what that means, let's do a little architectural history. Just for fun's sake. Archaic and classical Greek temples are most commonly rectangular in form. They stood on a raised base known as a stylobate. And on top of the stylobate sat an enclosed structure, the interior of the temple. The walled in area usually had a couple different parts. First, you'd enter through the pronaus, similar to the narthex in a church, which was basically the entrance room to the temple interior. From there, you'd enter the temple proper. This area was known as the naus in Greek or the cella in Latin, and there usually contained the cult statue the physical embodiment of the god himself or herself. Some special temples, like the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, actually had one extra room located in the interior of the temple, known as the Aditone. This was considered the Holy of Holies, and where it existed, this is where the cult statue was hidden away, back behind peering eyes. Attached to the back of the temple was the Apistodomos, or treasury, where gifts, like all those bronze tripods we just talked about, were kept to please the gods. But what about the columns, the most famous characteristic of Greek temples? Well, well, well. Columns surrounded the walled interior of the temple. A temple with one set of columns surrounding the temple was known as peripteral, while the temple with two sets of columns was diperipteral. The columns were then surmounted by capitals, which were one of the key features in determining the architectural order, or kind of standard building style, of the temple. 
Doric temples had plain bowl-shaped capitals. Ionic temples had capitals with scrolls known as volutes. And Corinthian capitals had capitals carved into a or Corinthian temples had capitals carved into a series of flowers. So a peripteral Doric temple, like that of Apollo at Delphi, was a temple with one set of surrounding columns, an interior walled-in area with a statue for uh, with a that held the statue of the god, and a set of plain bowl-shaped capitals sitting on top of the columns. It was with the, within the Adytone, the Holy of Holies, that the Pythia or priestess of Apollo sat and delivered her prophecies. This is who we call the Oracle of Delphi. It was within the Adytone, the Holy of Holies, that the Pythia or priestess of Apollo sat and delivered her prophecies. This is who we call the Oracle of Delphi. And it was thought that the priestess originally even predated the worship of Apollo, suggesting that they originally went all the way back to be associated with the mother goddess Gaia, right? And we remember her from that kind of founding story of the city where it's founded at the navel or omphalos of, the, of Mother Earth. Now, the reason we're discussing this in class on mind-altering substances is that the ancient sources suggest that the priestess was intoxicated on noxious fumes when delivering said prophecies. One major source on the topic is Herodotus. Another, we get the hymn to uh, Apollo, the Homeric hymn to Apollo. We also have Pausanias. And then invaluably, we've got Plutarch, who is actually a priest of the, the cult of Apollo at Delphi. And they tell us that the Pythia was selected as a young woman, sober and of good character, from among a group of priestesses that served the cult of Apollo at Delphi. Consulting the oracle was done by some of the most important figures in Greece and beyond. And we already saw how the Lydian king came to regret his visit to the Pythia. But these visits could only be done at certain times. It was only during spring, summer, and fall that you could go consult the priestess of Apollo, since Apollo was thought to have deserted Delphi in winter to go live among the Hyperboreans, a mythical race of giants living around the North Pole. Just in case you're worried that the temple was abandoned, it wasn't. Apollo's bro Dionysus came by and he like kind of held down the, the temple in, in Apollo's absence. Anyway, even while the oracle was in session, it only gave prophecies one day per month, in part because it was a physically exhausting endeavor for the Pythia priestess. On the seventh day of each month, the Pythia was taken to the Castalian Spring to bathe and purify herself. Then, drinking the waters of the Casotis Spring, which was inhabited by a naiad, or water nymph. The priestess was then accompanied by five oracular priests who carried laurel branches in honor of the god Apollo. The group headed up the sacred way towards the temple, bringing with them a young goat. Once outside the temple, the goat was sprinkled with water in preparation for its sacrifice. The goat's response was important. If it trembled at the sprinkling, omens were good, and the process would continue. But if it did not, the gods frowned upon the seeker of the prophecy, and the process was ended right there and then. If omens were good, the goat was then sacrificed, and priests read the entrails, so basically the guts of the goat, especially the liver. And at this point, once again, the priests either signaled good omens, or the, the omens were not good and the things ended right there. Assuming things went the right way, the goat was burned and the priests entered the temple through a gateway, inscribed with two famous phrases, Know thyself, and nothing in excess. Not bad advice to follow, and you didn't even have to consult the oracle to get those words of wisdom. As she made her way to the Aditone, literally the inaccessible space, she carried with her laurel branches sacred to Apollo, and purifying water from the Casota Spring. The Omphalos Stone, the physical representation of the center of the world, sat to one side, flanked by the two golden eagles representing Zeus's attempt to find Gaia's navel. Once inside, she sat upon a bronze tripod that straddled the chasm plunging deep into the earth. Legend has it that, this was, that it was into this chasm that the python fell after Apollo slew it. And since that time, the decaying body of the python has exuded fumes that would entrance anyone who inhaled it. The fumes were known in the Greek as pneuma, which roughly translates as breath or air or wind. The pneuma would, uh, would entrance the priestess, eventually throwing her into an ecstatic frenzy. And during this raving madness, she would proclaim the oracular words. 
and these were often mysterious, difficult to comprehend. The job of comprehension fell to the priests, who would translate these ravings into hexameter verse. So not only did you get a prophecy, you actually got a nice little poem as well. The priests were also involved in choosing who got to visit the oracle. And as you might imagine, many people desired to consult the world-famous oracle and get, you know, some good advice from the gods. And so on the day of her pronouncements, visitors drew lots, essentially lottery tickets, to see who would get to see her, and in what order. Now, of course, this wasn't as impartial as it sounds. Impressive donations to the priests would help ensure that someone received a favorable place in line. Seekers of oracular knowledge then met with the priests to formulate their question in the exact right way, which, of course, they had to pay for that consultation as well. Capitalists back then. Hmm. Finally, when all was set and ready to go, the supplicant would enter the temple, head into the auditorium, consult the Pythia, and wait for his or her answer. And for that answer to be translated then by the priests. The raving madness of the Pythia is the key link between the oracle at Delphi and mind-altering substances. And much of this connection stems from the writings of Plutarch, a famous Greek biographer living in the Roman period around the second century AD. Plutarch actually served as the high priest of Delphi for several years, and so his writings provide a unique perspective into this experience. He stated that the vapors rose through the chasm and originated from a spring that flowed under the temple. Modern scholars have taken a variety of guesses as to what sort of intoxicating gas this might have been, many believing it may have had hallucinogenic effects, hence the raving madness. Some suggest that it was a hydrocarbon gas, either ethylene or ethane, that was inhaled by the Pythia. These sweet-smelling gases would have been, like to some extent, used as an anesthetic in the ancient Greek world. But a lot of other scholars think that they would not have had kind of such dramatic effects that would have induced this kind of madness. Some small effect, but not creating the, the craziness that we get in the textual sources. Others argue for the possibility of methane, which in high enough quantities can displace oxygen in the brain. And once you lose that oxygen, that can lead to dizziness, loss of coordination, eventually unconsciousness. But this methane hypothesis is then based on the assumption that there was seismic activity in the area, in antiquity, and that it's that which is releasing the gases through the chasm. And that kind of seismic activity is still debated among scholars as well. Still others argue for a non-gas-based explanation. They suggest that plant-based drugs could have been ingested that would have produced similar results. And that the ancient sources that describe laurel are actually referring to some other plant. Like oleander, a small pink flowering shrub is a common candidate. If chewed or burned and inhaled, oleander had the potential to induce seizures. Perhaps that's the raving madness, which could have been interpreted by the Pythia. Um, as the Pythia being overtaken by the spirit of Apollo. Now, some contend that Oleander was burned in a chamber below the Aditone, and the fumes then rose through the chasm to the chamber where the priestess sat. And this would also explain why the oracular procedure was so physically difficult for the Pythia. And it fits into the kind of small underground space that is actually found archaeologically underneath uh, the Aditone of the Temple of Apollo. But even with that kind of supporting evidence, uh, clear-cut evidence for specifically oleander use, very, very far from conclusive. Other plant-based suggestions have been cannabis, causing relaxation and euphoria and hallucinations, rhododendron, which can have narcotic and stimulant, stimulant effects, and henbane, which can also cause hallucinations, delirium, and manic episodes. So while many scholars agree that the Oracle at Delphi was indeed under the influence of some sort of mind-altering substance, they disagree on the nature of that substance. Archaeological and geological investigations have made debating claims on the geothermal properties underneath the temple, some claiming that major faults intersect directly underneath the aditone, while others suggest these would not have uh, led to any kind of noxious fumes. And because no archaeological evidence of drug-related materials is preserved for us today, it becomes somewhat of a guessing or matching game trying to link Plutarch's observations to real-world phenomena. It's likely we'll never really know exactly what the Pythia was high on as she counseled some of the most influential men in the ancient Greek world. 
That being said, there are some important takeaways concerning the role of religion and drugs in culture in ancient Greece. Like for one, we're able to see a unique instance where gender roles have been inverted. And now it's a woman who's able to exert her influence over men through her association with religion and the gods. Let's not take it too far though. Now you have to remember that even though she's the one making the pronouncements, it's still men translating those uh, for the visitors to the temple. Perhaps most of all, however, we can see that it's the Greeks who viewed these kind of psychoactive, psychoactive substances as a way to connect intimately with the gods, to kind of embody the spirit of the gods. And the Pythia was thought to inhale the Pneuma so that the spirit of Apollo would take over her body. And regardless of the actual drug being used, this connection between drugs, the gods, and religious power seems to be an integral part of ancient Greek culture.